Candy Johnson, and I am the STEM coordinator for um, the Manny Jackson program, as well as the resource manager for the SIUE um, STEM Resource Center. So those are my two positions, and the past year I was working primarily as the STEM program coordinator for a partnership that SIUE has with the Manny Jackson Center for the Humanities. So today I'm just going to tell you a little bit about our partnership, the programs that I worked with, and then some things that I learned about it. <clears throat> so the partners for this project were the Manny Jackson Center, SIUE, and NSIUE, with NSIUE, um, the STEM Center, the IRS Center, and the College of Arts and Science collaborated um, for this project. We had partners from Lewis and Clark Community College, several area school districts, as well as the Madison County Housing Authority. So these are all of these groups that came together to kind of implement a plan that the Manny Jackson Center had to reach area youth, specifically those that are underrepresented, underrepresented and teach them leadership skills and skills um, so that they could be aware of and tackle social problems with STEM skills that we're giving them. So here's the program overview. This is a little blur that kind of sums up the program. STEM Meets Humanities programs was designed to foster young leaders who will solve the world's social problems through humanities focused STEM programming. Um, our four major pro or four focuses were the Digital Humanities Club, and I'll go into each one of these individually, math, games, robotics, and urban gardening. <coughs> So I'll start with Digital Humanities Club. And this is Gabby's featured on <laughs> So this was a year-long project that started in the fall of 2017 and ended last spring. And we did it in both Madison and Venice. We had two separate clubs. And with these Digital Humanities Clubs, we reached about 36th through 8th graders. Along with that, we also worked with four SIUE students um, who did sort of a near-peer mentoring system. That's what kind of all of our programs have. We have either um, high schoolers or SIU students working with our younger groups of students. Okay, now this, I'm gonna come over here and um, try to just show you some things that I have. So for the Digital Humanities Club, what we did, um, was the entire purpose for this was really to get students to have a voice, to um, share issues that were important to them about their communities, and talk about solutions, how they felt, in a way that they could share with the public. So what we chose to do was podcasts. So students did interviews, research topics that they were passionate about, and then pulled that all together in teams to make a podcast to share. I have a little interview audio clip that I just want to share. <coughs> it's my favorite one. Um, and the students learned interviewing skills. They, oh, before I show you the clip, I'll tell you the content. So the areas of interest of our students, our middle school students, were school lunches, school dress codes, area crime, and university basketball team. <laughs> so those are things that were important to them. They wanted to know um, how do, they wanted to share their feelings on these things. How do the teachers, administrators, um, police in the area feel about crime rates, things like that. What were um, adult solutions to some of the things that they had a problem with. They didn't, they don't enjoy the food. What is their principal thought on that? They feel that the crime rate is high and almost all of them knew someone that had been um, convicted of some sort of crime. So what do adults feel about this? How can we improve this for their communities? So this is a video clip about some school issues that a student at Madison Junior High, or a group of students at Madison Junior High, interviewed their principal. Oh, man. So as he's doing that, I'll tell you some of the people from the community that the students interviewed. They interviewed their principal, they interviewed an area um, police officer, 
they interviewed some basketball players from the SIUE basketball team, as well as a basketball coach. So they, we were thankfully able to get adults um, that were influ influential in the areas of interest um, for the students to talk to and, and have their questions answered. Well, it's playing on me. One more try. Okay. I'll try this one. Well, hearing sound. Though. It was coming through my laptop, but oh. ideally it would come through the. There, there we go. Yay! Thank you. No problem. Sorry that that took so. That's okay. Mr. Gardner, today I'm going to be talking to you about the school issues, and I'm going to ask you a few questions about the school uniform. <laughs> How do you feel about the school's dress code? I feel like the dress code is pretty liberal compared to schools I've been at. I've been at schools where you can only wear black shoes, you can only wear khaki pants, you can only wear a white shirt, you can only wear a blue shirt, and you could not rock a cell phone, uh, you could not have earphones around your neck, and everybody looked the same. In fact, our shirts, like you have Madison Spartans on, everybody had the same church shirts we were one band one sound and we do that that way that no kid feels badly because they can't afford the greatest latest designer clothes we want kids to feel comfortable in being in um, school gear so that's kind of where we're headed going down the road because I don't want any kid to feel um, less than instead of more than because he or she can't afford to wear this and that that's the whole premise to us having school uniforms, making kids feel comfortable and looking alike, uh, one band, one sound, without feeling pressured that they can't, their mom and daddy can't afford the clothes that they need. What would be an alternative for school uniforms? Alan there, I just wanted to end with her cute voice. <laughs> So um, that's just an example clip of some of the work that the students did. You can only wear a blue shirt. Hi, Mr. Gardner. Today I'm going to be talking to you about the school issues. And I'm going to ask you a few questions about the school uniform. <laughs> How do you feel about the school's dress code? Let me just close the oh, okay. thing. Sounds good. Thank you. There we go. We're back. So, okay. So that's a little, so you can see some of the student work. Um, also, if you're interested, I have an article that SIUE wrote, a feature of every program that we get that we did if you wanted to read more in depth about some of it. But Digital Humanities Club, I just wanted to point out that with that what we were doing is um, trying to get students to take something that they value um, and connect it to the humanities, talk about the history of their community, um, be able to talk to adults that have different experiences than them, and use STEM skills um, like recording skills using audacity or sound trap so that they're able to edit um, audio clips and make make a product um, that they can share with the world um, through their podcast. So that's Digital Humanities Club and then um, another program was Math Games League and that actually started in 2016 and it's currently going on. Uh, we've worked with Alton, Madison, and Venice the league that is still currently um, running is the Alton League, which has won the past two years um, the national championship. So that's exciting. Teams across the um, nation have competed, and SIUE actually hosted the tournament last year. So this one, this program uses more of um, an in-depth near peer mentor set up where we have SIUE stu students who mentor and teach the high school students how to work with fifth graders and then the high school students are completely in charge. So with this one we reached 40 fifth graders in these three areas combined, 14 high school students and four SIUE students. I have a video clip of this, so I'll try to, hopefully this one works. 
Um, but with math games, what it is, is it's a hands-on, what we do is instead of doing like pencil to paper math, it is all hands-on physical activity. So it's more like a sporting event. So math games is really fun. It's something that I had never experienced before, but we have a, I have a little video clip that I wanted to show you that pretty much sums up math games and has some student testimonials in it as well, because it's important to kind of hear the student voice when you're doing these programs. Okay, so that is our math games program, and I think that video does a great job of explaining what we do um, and the effect that it had on the kids. It was really positive. We had parents come up afterwards and say their student that had an F now had a B in, in math, and our pre-tests really were it was like zeros almost across the board. And then our post-tests were, I think the average was a 70%. So there was a complete improvement for the students. And um, I think the, this goes through the Young People's Project and they're trying to just increase their numbers so that we can uh, kind of improve more students' relationships with math. So that's Math Games League and that really did a great job of not only focusing on math, but teamwork, mentoring. The students got to know um, people older than them, people from different schools, um, so it really helped with their social skills as well. Then we have urban gardening, and one of our instructors is right there, <laughs> or our, our instructor is right there, Colin Wilson. And this program started in 2016 with a program called HUG that incorporated hydroponics. Urban gardening um, still focus, uh, focuses on the urban gardening. It's HUG as hydroponics and urban gardening for girls. Um, urban gardening still focuses on our Powered by Girls group, which is all girls, and it's a um, group with the Madison County Housing Authority that is basically um, made to empower young girls and let them know that they can do science too. They can do all of these um, things, and they work with more than just us on empowering these young girls. So. Powered by Girls was at four sites, four Madison County Housing Authority sites, and reached about 60 kids. Um, and Colin did things with plant science, as well as um, worked on final projects to show the girls how can you actually put urban gardening in practice. They built raised bed gardens, seed packages, they did um, hands-on plant dissections, and I actually am doing a program with them right now. So I'm at those same sites and I see their raised bed gardens and it's amazing. These gardens are amazing. There will be tomatoes and there were green peppers the other day and I was like, can I have green pepper? You know, it's like these, they look gorgeous and delicious. So even though Colin started this with them in January, they're still like reaping those benefits and the community is still using those vegetables um, and sharing them and it's, it's something that they've really made a difference in their community so far. And that program is going to continue. So they'll be able to keep learning more, learn more ways and new ways to bring fresh produce and plant science knowledge um, to them and their families, as well as um, possibly gain more skills to keep growing and maintaining their gardens that they've built. I also have a nice article on that, um, and I'll share the articles in the PowerPoint with Ben to share with everyone. Um, and then robotics, that's a program that I'm instructing. That just started this past summer and I'm working with the same group of girls that Colin worked with with urban gardening, except for over the summer we added boys into the mix. Um, now for the academic year, we're back to just girls and I got some <laughs> feedback from the girls and some of them loved it. They said it was fun with the boys and then some of them said they just like the girls because the boys are kind of um, mean and messy. So. Uh, that's some feedback that I got, so that's really interesting. So maybe we'll keep that, where we just introduce boys every once in a while. Um, but robotics <laughs> has reached about 80 kids, so that's that's been really great. We had a big group this summer, and I have about 20 girls at each site. And it's it's crazy, it's overwhelmingly good to have so many, so many girls that are learning about robots. Um, over the summer, you can see this picture, I had an intern with me a noise intern, and then now I'm instructing solo. Um, this semester, though, we're incorporating a little more um, environmental
environmental science over the summer, we kind of connected with the real world through Mars rovers and things like that so that they can know there is a real world application to this and what's going on. We had a Mars Minute where we kind of posted updated them on some current events. Um, and then with the with this semester, we're going to be doing some environmental science. We did a challenge with recycling where they just learned the basics of recycling and had their robot arms compete to see who could recycle cans the fastest. So they love the competition. Um, but the coolest thing about this summer is, I'm going to show you this picture. The students built that rover from scratch. We had first graders through ninth graders was our range. And the individual bolts, tools, wires, all of that was just on the table. Here's instructions, let's go. And I kid you not, even though I wrote this with like a middle schooler in mind, first graders were able to like put together um, these wires and understand the basics of the circuits and things like that. So it's incredible and I really feel like it showed me that we can challenge students a little more than what we do or just looking at maybe next generation science standards or common core standards. Yes, that is a uh, stepping off point when you're planning, but you can even go beyond that and go a couple of grades ahead and challenge these students and they can usually catch up pretty quickly. So impressive, it's been really fun. Um, and now we're not just working on the rover that can move, that it also has video camera use where you could be inside and have your rover be outside and do a mission where your team, we did something where we had the team guiding you and then all you could see was your camera and we have walkie talkies, they love the walkie talkies for some reason, we have walkie talkies and, and things and complete missions like that. So this semester we're adding in arms. So okay, we know what to do with a rover that has wheels and a camera. Now what can we do with rovers and robots with arms and, and things like that and understand the um, different complexities of robots. So that's been really nice. Now I just wanted to put, put a slide up of kind of what I learned throughout this process, what I have learned and I'm still learning. And I think the biggest takeaway for me is student engagement is the most important thing. First of all, you need student participants and attendance. That's the first. Once you have that, you, they need to be engaged or else if this is a, a voluntary outreach program, you will not keep attendance if you're not engaging these students. So that is, I think, the most important thing. And not just having the students there and participating, but also for them to gain something from it. They have to be invested and find it interesting and willing to learn and opening up. Um, so I just put a couple of points and I feel like some of these are something that would be Something that I would say might be common sense, but for some reason, a lot of programs when they're being made, some of this gets lost. Um, so I just wanted to kind of revisit some basic four points of how to truly engage a student. I think first is listening to the community when you're planning. Um, I have been a part of a lot of projects and seen a lot of projects that I wasn't even a part of being made, and I think sometimes when, let's say, um, a group of people plan something for another group of people without even consulting them. That might not necessarily be successful. I feel like you have to consult the adults and students if you can of a community to see what do you want, what are you interested in, what are you okay with, you know, what boundaries are there, things like that. So just um, first of all to get any sort of engagement, listen to the community and that can mean a number of different people and when you're planning. Then once it is being implemented, I think first showing the, your participants and students that you value their opinions and interests. So it's not just like, I think this is important and I want you to learn it. More like, I think this is important. What do you think about these issues and how can we go about addressing these um, issues, addressing these skills, um, teaching you this knowledge in a way that is valuable to you and in a way that interests you in a way that you think applies to your life. Um, surveys, I feel like a lot of, I know a lot of us always gather feedback and surveys and things like that, but do we really always go through and read and actually implement and, and value every survey as if it's important? Sometimes we don't. So I think just reminding ourselves to actually use tools and actually use people's opinions and feedback, whether it's verbal or on surveys, um, to listen to that and apply that to either that program or the next program that you do. Um, 
content choice, I thought with, um, for instance, for the Digital Humanities Club, the fact that the students got to choose what they wanted to work on all year is very important. They're choosing something they're interested in rather than you just assigning something um, to them. So if there is the possibility for them to choose the content, and then also to get to know the students, if that's not, I mean, not everyone is personable or not everyone is great with the middle school student, but if you're not, um, maybe find ways to get to know not get to get to know about their personality and interests. Uh, whether it's playing games, sometimes it's surveys, sometimes it's just talking to them, telling them about yourself. I found that that is valuable. When a student doesn't know me and I walk into a classroom, um, let's say if I'm just kind of supervising a, a, a program and I'm not interacting with the students, it is completely different than when I walk into my robotics classroom where I'm interacting with students and I know their names and I know their personalities. They respond to me completely differently. Um, so I just know that um, the people that are in charge of instruction really have to make an effort to show the students that, they, that they're valued as individuals and not just subjects in some sort of project or experiment or grant or you know things like that. Um, and then make it relatable as you get to know their personal lives and have them make choices and figure out their interests. Um, make sure that you clearly relate those to their lives. Sometimes a third grader can't necessarily make a connection that you think is obvious. So making clear those connections and why it's important to you, uh, why it's important to the world today, current events and things of that nature. And then also careers. These are the choices, these are options of careers that you can have. Um, these are real world applications. You don't have to do it, but if you are interested, we're gonna give you the tools to it. If you're not interested, you're gonna learn about something that's real. And then, of course, make it fun. I have noticed that if you can make something pleasing to all five senses, this is an outreach program, this is just getting to know people, this is anything. If you can make something pleasing to all five senses, that person is usually on board or in favor of you or will have a positive view of you or will enjoy their experience. Now that seems kind of hard, but sometimes, um, like hands-on, they want to touch things, they want to um, be manipulating a plant. They want to get dirty. Even if they really don't want to get dirty, they want to get dirty. They want to do these things. I've done things with um, where students collected live bugs. They all thought it was gross, but by the end, they were loving it, and, and they had no fear. It's just being introduced to something new sometimes. Movement, like math games, having them run around. Um, having them, um, for digital humanities, having them stand up out of their seats and walk around and and meet new people and go to different rooms and areas to, to do their recordings. If it is some, if it is a program that is presented during a meal time or snack time, I have noticed you have to have snacks. And that's something that I feel like we've done a good job at, but um, like if there is a need, like if a student is sleep deprived or is hungry or they're not gonna pay attention, and especially when you work with underserved or underrepresented populations like I usually do, there are a lot of students that are tired. They have responsibilities that some students don't necessarily have or they might really be hungry. So if you're going to ask them to be a part of something at a certain time, you have to make sure that their needs are met or choose a different time. Um, things like music, if you have some sort of free time, I say, let kids listen to some music. If you don't like the music they listen to, choose the music yourself. You know, sometimes see if that is an interest, which it is to a lot of young people. Um, have snacks, have music. Ask them if they have a favorite smell. Smell. I mean, really, bring in something, make their classroom that might smell like middle school boys, and make it smell nice for them for once so that they enjoy being there and feel at peace. Um, and then incorporate their interests. Maybe do a survey and say, what are you interested in? What is your favorite music? What's your favorite snack? Things like that, and just give them a say. Make them feel like you value them as individuals. And make it so that they really enjoy what they're doing, that they feel safe, um, and that they feel like they're getting something valuable out of it. And then I really do think that that is what makes an engaged student. So that's kind of what I'm learning. Um, I'm taking notes, and as I do more programs, I'm trying to make sure I incorporate some of the things that I've learned. And sometimes it's harder than others when you don't have the resources um, to make it perfect, but, but just getting as close as possible. So I added some contact information. The Manny Jackson Center for the Humanities 
um, is in downtown Edwardsville. They have a website, and then I work for the STEM Resource Center, and that's in Science East. We have a new space, so you guys can come visit anytime. Um, we have a new website that's really great, too. And then I included my personal contact information because I'm a talker, so if you ever wanted to just talk about any of the programs or have any ideas or something that the STEM Resource Center maybe could be offering faculty or students at SIUE, just shoot me an email or give me a call. That's something I'm trying to make really clear and available to everybody now. I don't mind talking, I don't mind suggestions, I actually value and appreciate them. So I'm just trying to get if someone wants like, oh, you don't have this book or you don't have this whatever, tell me. And then I'm, I'm keeping a running list of everyone's suggestions, wants, wish lists. And then if we ever do have the resources or the funds to get these things that are valuable to people, then, then we'll get them and I'll let you know. So that is Send Me to Humanities. Um, so thank you for listening about the update of the programs and I'm sorry about a few of the sound, you know, issues and stuff, but thank you guys for being troopers with us.